Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, we've been back to the, we've been to the future and we're going, going kind of back to the past now. Um, because I want to talk to you about Darwin today. So uh, when Charles Darwin was about 22 years old, he had just graduated as a geologist. And um, this was a great time for him to kind of look around on, on what to do next. And he was lucky to be invited on this massive ship, Her Majesty's Beagle, which was about to set off on a five-year journey across the, the oceans of the world. Uh, and it was full of scientists that wanted to, to do experiments and, and figure things out uh, uh, about, you know, uh, natural phenomena in the world. Um, and uh, uh, one very specific part of this five-year journey was about a month that they spent on the Galapagos Islands. And on the Galapagos Islands, um, what is very special about that place is that it is home to a lot of different natural uh, species, a lot of variety in species, that only, some of them only exist in that particular place. So Darwin was really interested and excited, and he kind of started collecting species there and, and specimens of these species, and he sent them home uh, uh, to London. And uh, when he got back, he started studying them. And one thing that he, he figured about these species is that not only was there uh, a lot of different species there, there was also a lot of variety within species. Uh, a famous example that he uh, gives in his books uh, is that of different finches. So as you can see, the finches uh, in this picture, they all have different uh, sizes in, in beaks. So there's variety within the, uh, in the species. Uh, and what he figured is that that was due to adaptation. Uh, and he figured out because they all came from different islands where the circumstances were all slightly different. Uh, on those islands, the food supply was different. So the, the, uh, the beaks that these, these different finches had had to be different to, to really make sense for, uh, for the birds on that island. So they had adapted to their environment. Not in their own lifetime, of course. That was something that happened over many, many generations of, uh, of birds. So basically, the ones that didn't survive on the islands were the ones that had the wrong size of, of beak. And the ones that did survive uh, and made it and passed on their genes uh, were the ones that, that had suitable uh, things for their environment. Uh, now, Darwin called this uh, process descent with modification uh, in his book. We now know it as the theory of, of evolution through natural selection. Uh, and, and today I want to talk about the evolution of, of, of course, something else of, of the web. I want to talk about uh, websites without style, because that was kind of where the evolution of, of the web started. Uh, the very first websites, they just had structure. Uh, and that was fine because it was used by scientists that used it to exchange documents and they cared a lot more about the content than about the style. But soon enough, people started wondering, can we have styling capabilities like we have in software that we're used to? Like, you know, they had word processors that they could use. Uh, so they wanted to have style and there were different solutions for that imaginable. So one of the things that, that kind of started to happen at that time was that uh, Netscape put uh, tags into HTML to make style happen in HTML. So they introduced elements like the center tag that would allow you to center stuff uh, on the page. But a number of people didn't really agree with that approach because it would really mix style and structure with each other, and they didn't like that. So they started proposing uh, different things, alternatives to that, uh, to that approach. Uh, for example, there was Payways proposal, which would allow you to select elements on a page and say what they would need to look like, something that we also know, of course, in, in CSS. Uh, this was the first uh, proposal that had uh, uh, some concept of inheritance. So you only needed to say what the font needs to be in the body, and then it would just also do that for other elements on the page. Uh, and that allowed you to write really short style sheets. And that was kind of the, the point of that. Now, many different proposals happened that I won't go through uh, uh, today, but one of the proposals that made it uh, uh, later on is cascading HTML style sheets, which was a proposal by Hauke Muyemili about a year after Payway's original proposal. There had been a lot of discussion on the mailing lists, uh, and, and this seemed to be a proposal um, that, that people really liked. A couple of odd things from that, it had time awareness, so you could style your document based on how old it was. So you could say, this is three days old, I'm going to make this yellow. Uh, it also had things like uh, display height, which is super familiar uh, to us now because we have responsive web design. So based on your display height, uh, how can we imagined, you could then have different style sheets. And that's pretty much what we do when we make websites that work on both phones and desktop. 
Uh, and then there was the principle of weighted influence, and that was the thing that set uh, uh, cascading HTML style sheets apart from all the other proposals. Um, because what this did, it solved the problem of who is responsible for styling a, a website. As I mentioned before, uh, it was the browser that decided what websites look like. Um, but uh, how come we really felt that it was important to give other uh, stakeholders a say, namely designers. Designers wanted to have some influence over what websites look like, uh, but also users. So this, this triangle of different influences, the browser, the user, uh, and designers, they all wanted to have a say. And he thought it would be good to give them percentages so that they can say how much of a say they would want to have in the final product. Uh, this is very different from a state machine, I, I guess, because basically what he had imagined was if you said this style is 30% worth as a designer and the user had said I want this for 70% worth, you would get a weighted, uh, the weighted uh, average of these values and that would get applied. Can imagine how that would work with font sizes, maybe, but especially with typefaces, that would be really weird because you'd get like a morph between different styles and that's just not how that, that should work. Um, but people like the idea anyway of cascading HTML style sheets. They really enjoyed to have the separation between uh, semantics and, and, uh, and what it looked like. They also liked the cascade that, that existed there. Um, so soon enough, uh, people started writing a charter. Bert Voss uh, uh, did that. Uh, and that kind of reads like a, a set of design guidelines for, uh, for CSS. Some things that are interesting in there is that it wasn't just meant for screens, but they also had imagined to make it work for paper, for Bray, and for speech. So or already at that start, it was kind of a thing to be more universal than just for screens. Uh, and it had to apply not just to HTML, but also to other markup languages. So they, they had ambition. Now, a short timeline. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of discussions on, uh, on this language in mailing lists. Uh, but in 1995, uh, some people came together here in Paris to discuss the first proposals. And this is also where that cascading HTML style sheet proposal was, was discussed. Uh, and soon after that, work started on developing the language further uh, and, and getting it towards uh, uh, level one of CSS. Just before that, IE3 already started implementing this, so it, had the first, it was the first browser to implement CSS. Uh, and a little bit later, uh, it became a recommendation as well. Now, after that, things moved sort of quickly, at least uh, uh, looking at it from now. But let's look at what level one had. It had a lot of the things that we know of CSS today and that we love or, or hate about it, like the cascade, uh, inheritance, uh, uh, things like formatting so that you could have inline and, and block elements. All those kind of things already existed in that very first level one uh, specification. Uh, after that, a CSS working group was formed uh, so that people could work more structurally uh, on this language. More browsers started supporting it, like Netscape Navigator embraced this new idea. Uh, Internet Explorer 4 uh, implemented some of CSS. Uh, Opera also joined, so now three browsers uh, made use of CSS. Uh, and level 2 also was introduced, and that had things like positioning and table layout. Speaking of table layout, that was kind of the way you would do uh, a lot of um, layout on the web for, for a long time. David Sikel is one of the people who wrote books about how to, how to do that. Uh, and when CSS got more, uh, more mature and more um, developed, he wrote a beautiful essay called The Web is Ruined and I Ruined It, where he explains, OK, now it's time to stop using tables and stop using spacer gives, which he had invented. He said, just learn to use style sheets today. So that was kind of the time where people started encouraging each other. Let's, let's go for this new language and you know, let's start to use it. Uh, and after that, you know, CSS developed and became lots bigger. Uh, it no longer is one specification. It's now a big amount of specifications, lots of different modules. Uh, that are made by a lot of different people, so that working group is much bigger than it was at the time. Uh, and they get input from designers and developers uh, worldwide. And if you want to input it, uh, an awesome talk about that is by Rachel Andrew that she gave at CSS Conf uh, in 2017. Um, but yes, they do want input from, from everyone uh, in developing the language. Now, a lot happened in between, but there's some things that I find really exciting about CSS today is that we have a powerful layout mechanism, uh, or two, actually. We have Flexbox and we have Grid, both of which let us like, have control over white space and alignment in ways that didn't really exist before. So 
I'm very excited about the layout possibilities that we, that we have and that's upgrade uh, shift in Firefox yesterday. Pretty awesome. And, and then there's things like custom properties, which were talked about a lot today. Uh, uh, Houdini, of course, which gives us access to the style layer, like things like Service Worker, give us access to the network layer of the browser. We now get to access the style layer and write JavaScript to make our own CSS. So, you know, the future is here. There's a lot of developments. But let's look at how CSS was the thing, the language that really stood out. What made CSS win? And what was kind of, when we look at the birds that Darwin had, uh, he had these different beaks that these birds had, and that's how they survived over many generations. So what were the, the unique features of CSS that made that language survive? Now, I think one of the most important things is simplicity. Uh, simplicity was, I think, the main design principle of CSS. There were a lot of different proposals that were a lot less simple. Uh, this one is the one that made it, and I think it is really due to uh, simplicity. Uh, and then I'm talking about things like if you have a scientific paper with lots of headings and you wanted to make all of them red, the syntax for that was really easy to understand. Of course, there are also things in CSS that are harder to understand, like how specificity works or how the cascade works. But even the cascade is something uh, that exists, I think, to keep style sheets small. Because you can rely on fullbacks, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a feature of CSS, to keep style sheets a lot shorter. Because you only need to define a thing once, and then other things will inherit that stuff, which is now also called leaking. So you know, some people like it, some people hate it. Something else that made CSS really stand out, I think, is that it allowed HTML to be medium agnostic. Uh, so no longer did you have to write different HTML for different media. You could choose the same HTML because uh, uh, CSS would cater for the different media that existed. So you can write CSS for, for books, for different types of screens, uh, and even for speech. There's a speech module as well. And that's all possible uh, because we have a separation in style and, and, and in content. Now, another great thing about CSS is that it isn't a programming language, which um, is controversial. I'll get into that. But uh, it is one of the things that the inventors found really important. They made sure that it wasn't a Turing complete language, uh, because that would really make it difficult to read and expensive to maintain, says Hauke Wim Lee in his PhD thesis, um, which is about, uh, about CSS. So that was a conscious decision. But you can make the claim that CSS is a programming language and it can do algorithms in CSS, as Laura Shank beautifully did at CSS Day this year. Um, there's the post that was mentioned earlier by uh, Anna Tudor, where she implements parts of logic in CSS with custom property. So yes, you can make the case that CSS is a programming language. But the low barrier uh, was definitely a thing that helped CSS uh, achieve what it has achieved. Now let's look at how the environment changed for CSS. Uh, the environment for uh, the birds was, of course, those different islands that I mentioned. The environment for CSS is, is really the web. So let's look at how that changed over uh, those last 25 years. One thing that is really apparent, I think, is that graphic design has gotten a lot more uh, professional. Uh, Jason already mentioned a bit of that uh, and showed some beautiful examples. I think we really think about graphic design very differently. We're not just styling uh, a scientific paper. We have elaborate systems of, uh, of design with grids and color and different ways to achieve visual hierarchy. So we really think about it much more uh, than we did at the time. So that's a big change. There's also a lot more. Um, unknown content, which I think is something that wasn't the case when CSS was first introduced, but it's something that it aged really well for. Um, I like to watch Brexit live streams, and they just keep putting in new, uh, news items, and they all get styled all the time, because that just works if you put new content in. So unknown content is another uh, uh, big thing. And then there is the way we think about architecture, both as designers and developers. Uh, we've started to move away from thinking in terms of pages and really think in terms of components. Uh, and uh, there's a great, uh, great post about that where uh, they look at the difference between uh, uh, separating concerns, because we really start to separate our concerns differently than we used to. So when there was pages, we would separate between HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But now, we kind of separate within components. Uh, that's something that Emily mentioned earlier, and, and Sarah as well. And then, of course, tooling is something that really, really changed uh, uh, how we work on the web. Uh, so we have a lot more tooling. Some of the early proposals for CSS were, were kind of canceled because the tooling was too complicated. And I think maybe they would have survived today because we have a more uh, for right tooling landscape, I should say. Now, CSS has adapted um, a lot, I think. Uh, there's been many, many changes since that very first proposal. 
Um, and I want to look at a couple of things that have, have made CSS uh, different in, uh, for the modern day, basically. The first thing to say about that is that CSS is fine, like it is being used as the styling language for almost every website out there. So it is, the, you know, it is still the language that we all use. But there are people who adapt CSS to make it work for their specific environments. Um, and utility classes are uh, a, a great example of that, I think. Uh, so utility first CSS, as Sarah talked about in the first talk. Um, so I don't really need to explain how it works. Um, but I did read this blog post where Johan Ronse to compare it to uh, a set of predefined design tokens. And I think that's a fun way to think about it, because you define maybe design tokens in, in JSON, but you can think of them as, as CSS classes as well. Now, what you do with, uh, with uh, utility classes is I think you give up the separation of content and style that was so important in the early days of CSS. But what you get back, as Sarah so beautifully explained, uh, is you get a lot of scalability and maintainability uh, uh, for that in return. I am going to try that after uh, seeing that talk this, uh, this afternoon. And then, of course, there is also CSS in, in JS. I think that's uh, the other big adaptation that people have done to make CSS work for their environment. And of course, I'm not talking about JavaScript style sheets, which were introduced by Netscape in 1997 as some fun idea to kind of put um, some CSS into, into JavaScript. Didn't really take off. Uh, but I'm talking about this, this plethora of different tools that allow you to abstract CSS away from kind of style sheets and, and do it in your components. Uh, and it will automatically take care of things like doing your class names for you. Um, this is not because people hate CSS. Uh, for example, Max Stoiber uh, of Style Components explains that CSS, according to him, isn't a bad language. It is awesome, but he just wants to use it differently. Uh, that's also something I heard Mark Dalgis say. Uh, managing CSS is about taking a, a reasonable subset of the language if you want to do it at scale. And a subset of the language um, is something I want to look at a little bit closer. So these are a couple of things that you see across different CSS and JS libraries that happen. So um, they remove specificity sometimes. They remove the cascade so that they don't get leaking between different components. Um, there's this uh, notion of you don't really need class names anymore if you do everything in your components. Um, Pseudo classes sometimes don't happen, like in React Native for Web. Um, and the goal of all of that is to enforce a stricter contract. And I think that's a really, really interesting notion that I will talk about a bit more later. Now, I think you are getting less features if you do this, but you get something that is a lot more predictable. And I think that is something that a lot of organizations need. So it's, it is really about making CSS work for, for your environment. Now, of course, there are excesses, as Anna Tudor showed when she took apart Twitter.com and took out the close button that they have on their modals. It has 200 different declarations in CSS to do that single close button. And I think that is something we need to think about, I guess, um, because I don't know what that looks like for, uh, for the Twitter engineers that work with the components. Maybe they have a, a simple uh, interface there. But what you see in the browser is quite a lot of uh, style declarations that aren't all needed. Um, and another question to ask here is really, does CSS lack in contract strictness? Because that's something I see a lot of CSS and JS engineers say. Um, and yeah, I think I'm generally not sure. I'm not trying to be ironic or sarcastic here. Um, but yeah, I think clearly some organizations need something that is kind of a simpler contract than uh, the contract that includes things like the cascade and specificity. Because uh, uh, for that to work, uh, you need to, to have an understanding of your whole project. And if your project is really big, uh, that is impossible. So you need a solution that kind of solves that problem. Uh, but the contract is quite strong because CSS specifications specify exactly how everything is supposed to work. And sometimes browsers introduce bugs, but usually they don't. Usually they follow the specifications, especially in, in evergreen browsers. So the specifications are pretty clear. The contract is pretty clear. Uh, but it isn't very simple. Uh, so I can totally imagine people using that. So going back to the different islands that Darwin's birds lived on, um, I think we can see the CSS landscape kind of like that. So a lot of people enjoy using vanilla CSS. Uh, and some people have organizational needs or um, you know, Twitter.com's app is their main uh, product, so they really need this really strict contract, uh, their environment needs them to have uh, you know, a different way of approaching CSS and maybe use a, sips, a subset of the language. 
Uh, and that's kind of what I want to end with. So I think CSS is awesome. It's here to stay 25 years after the first proposals came about. Uh, I think it is awesome. And uh, thanks very much for listening.